All right. Hello and welcome once again to White Lotus of Light conversational series. And this is part two of my conversation with Walter Bosley. Uh, I highly recommend you go back and watch part one. This part should stand on its own to some degree, but uh, because uh, Walter's expertise is in a somewhat lesser well-known area of, for lack of a better word, ufology, um, I highly recommend that you go back and watch part one. But this this episode should be quite interesting in its own right. And uh, what we're gonna talk about today is um, in part one, Walter goes into um, the uh, 19th century origin of the uh, what, what is commonly called the secret space program, not to be confused with the junk conspiracy nonsense, but actually the really grounded uh, sort of discussion about the fact that there seems a high likelihood that there is uh, hidden technology that I sometimes refer to as ultra tech simply because it's so far beyond the technology that we have at our fingertips, even with some of the amazing stuff we have, that it is really in its own classification. It's sometimes called the breakaway civilization or civilizations. Um, and it's this theory, uh, which I believe is fairly grounded in fact through the work of people like Walter, um, Michael Schratt, I highly recommend uh, if you're interested in the subject, go watch the 2015 Secret Space Program lectures of which Walter has one of them, which is excellent. There's also Dr. Joseph Farrell, um, uh, Paul Le Leviolette, and also uh, Michael Schratt. And Michael Schratt um, has a whole thing that to me is almost ironclad evidence of that there is extremely high technology. We're talking things like anti-gravity and if not free energy, um, energy source that is uh, beyond the standard combustion or nuclear paradigm and is either cold fusion based, meaning tabletop fusion doesn't require a gigantic reactor or uh, what some people call zero point technology or what Tesla sometimes talked about the ability to draw energy from um, sort of like the universe around us, that the universe is awash in energy, we just have to tune and draw it in. And so uh, this theory of the breakaway civilization uh, says that at this point in time, much of what, what people see in the sky when they have a legitimate, uh, meaning it's not drug-induced, although perhaps that can help you perceive it. Uh, it's not um, someone having some kind of psychological issue, but it's a grounded report about um, objects in, in the sky, uh, UFOs, I won't use that damn UAP term, I don't like that at all. Um, when you see an unidentified flying object do something like, I've seen this myself, uh, I saw a uh, glowing orb in the sky, move across the sky east to west, and then suddenly go vertical at a 90 degree turn and accelerate. And according to any technology we have, not even a helicopter should be able to do that kind of sharp turn. Uh, that was actually here in the state of Oregon. And then I had a similar experience when I was in Guatemala, where I saw several objects making uh, seemingly impossible, according to uh, what we understand about um, aerospace, or what's publicly available uh, maneuvers. And so when people see these kinds of objects in the sky, uh, and it's a credible and, and um, a reasonable report or experience that perhaps you had like I had, then my personal belief uh, has come around to the idea that the vast majority of them, I'm going to say 95% of them, just to use an approximate figure, Walter says 90% of them, are probably uh, governments or corporations or ex extremely wealthy groups or individuals who have technology that's way beyond what is disclosed publicly uh, and that it fits the definition of like the, the classic flying saucer. Often these are cigar shaped objects or uh, uh, triangular craft is another very commonly seen one. Um, and so that sort of technology is often called um, the secret space program or a clandestine space program or sometimes breakaway civilizations. And so in part one, we talk a lot about um, Walter's book, Origin, uh, the 19th century emergence of the 20th century breakaway civilizations, which is what, what I'm talking about here. And in that, uh, we go quite a bit into uh, the Sonora Aero Club and the airship mysteries of the 1890s. And while I find that, and how that is sort of an antecedent or lead into some of the technology that came out of the Third Reich, 
um, such as Die Glocke or The Bell. Um, and we go into all that in great detail in part one. Um, and then Walter's book is fantastic. I highly recommend buying it and I'll have all this information down below. Uh, in part two, we're going to talk about what to me is almost an even more interesting thread, which is uh, Walter has been able to trace this phenomenon of the Sonora Aero Club a very, it's a hypothesis, of course, this is all based on, um, you know, we just have fragments of information, but a, a hypothesis as to where the uh, ideas or, or perhaps even schematics might have uh, been involved that allowed this um, American, German, or Prussian, more accurately, uh, milieu of the Sonora Aero Club, where they may have gotten their ideas from. And so I'm not going to go into Walter's background uh, so much in this part. Go watch part one. Walter has an amazing background uh, in American uh, national security and intelligence. Uh, just real briefly, worked in FBI counterintelligence and also uh, in Air Force intelligence. And so Walter's also an incredible researcher. And so Walter, uh, the Sonoro Aero Club is Prussian in nature, uh, which is to say what we would call German now. Um, in the 1840s, actually, Germany was not a full-fledged country. As I said in part one, I, my state weirdly is one year older than uh, the country of Germany, which was actually founded in 1860. Um, and so prior to that, it was a series of duchies and principalities and kingdoms and so forth held together by a common language. And then there was a Prussian nationalist movement that brought about the formation of Germany and then the Prussian Empire. And so you have a very interesting theory as to where they would have gotten this uh, potential information from. And do you want to just launch right into that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, say that NIMSA the, the parent organization, which we talked about in part one, that was a very Prussian organization. The Sonora Aero Club was very American, very okay. particularly very Californian. Okay. Peter Menace himself, the leader, and several of these German immigrants, they loved to dress like what you know the the traditional cowboys. They wore the <laughs> cowboy boots and the the cowboy hats and that's and all awesome. That. Yeah, and uh, however, they were you know, indeed, German immigrants with a few of um, Italian immigrants who were farmers. Um, and uh, their, their parent organization, having been NIMSA, according to Delschau, yes, very much a Prussian organization that was dedicated to a unified Germany, which, as you said, happened subsequent to this era. Um, and the interesting potential technological thread that takes us back centuries um, may be found in this Prussian connection because um, it, the what we what we today refer to as Prussian and you know uh, Prussia but Prussian mm -hmm. in particular where Germany is concerned is actually somewhat of a creation of a class of German um, uh, merchants and uh, in some cases agricultural leaders, so to speak, mm -hmm. magnates or whatever, um, dating back to the medieval era of what, mm -hmm. you know, we have known as Germany. And mm -hmm. they were, they were uh, called the Junkers, the Junkers mm -hmm. class. And they were this interesting group that was greatly behind. Uh, ultimately, they were the, you know, involved with this push toward a unified Germany. But back in the medieval era, they had developed some interesting political philosophy, you know, that they, they followed. And, and one of their things that they would do, that they, that they started doing back then, was getting themselves ingratiated with a powerful group or state. And in this case, in the medieval era, they got, uh, they got themselves attached to it, ingratiated with the Teutonic Knights. Now, the Teutonic Knights were kind of the, the Templars of, you know, Germany, of these Prussian, at that time, Prussian states and uh, kingdoms, you know, at, at that time, and um, they, this Junkers class, very slyly made themselves indispensable to the Teutonic Knights, but also contributed to corrupting them from within, and ultimately uh, befriended their adversaries, 
and helped in in bringing down the power and control that that the Teutonic Knights had exhibited in Prussian Germany, and they did this on purpose. The, uh, the the best way you can describe this particular Junkers group that came to be identified, you know, with the Prussians, uh, is duplicitous, and um, this is something that they continued through the centuries. Uh, in fact, they themselves are not what you would call authentic Prussians. Uh, uh, Prussia was a particular area of Germany and. Poland and such back then in medieval times. And uh, this Junkers class, they got control of the people who controlled the state and the militaries and stuff there. And they basically uh, uh, stole the Prussian identity, if that you know makes any sense. And, and Prussians, as we know them today, what they developed into is actually this separate thing than what authentic Prussians were. It, it's like they, they went in and erased the, the actual Prussian culture and replaced it with this thing that they had created that, that's big on statism and, and what would mm -hmm. become fascism and, and things like that. Now, the technology, the technological thread that I think led to what the what NIMSA was developing and trying to do, um, which ultimately led to what Nazi Germany was doing, um, this comes very probably from the Teutonic Knights, and this might be one of the reasons why these this Junkers class targeted the Teutonic Knights. Okay, um, the Teutonic Knights were very much an active part of the Fourth Crusade. Now, the Fourth Crusade <laughs> was originally um, put together to once again go into the Holy Land. And um, a funny thing happened on the way to the Holy Land. They decided to, uh, they, they stopped to resupply and stage their crusade, uh, crusader invasion from Constantinople. And the, the funny thing that happened was, uh, Golly, they decided to sack Constantinople, which actually, you know, scholars point out was the plan all along. Right. Now, the Templars themselves were not involved in any of the combat operations, the actual raiding, but their resources were used in the Fourth Crusade. Um, so they were likely uh, beneficiaries of information that was captured there and the Teutonic Knights definitely who were a part of the actual operations of, of raiding and, and crusading against another Christian city, another city mm -hmm. state. Um, uh, because, you know, there, there was always that rivalry between, you know, the, 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 the empire of the West and the Christian empire of the East. And this was the West's way of, you know, finally slapping down the East so to speak. And um, uh, the Teutonic Knights were definitely part of, of the actual assault. And interestingly, one of the targets of the Fourth Crusade assaults was the, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the, the actual name. It, 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 was the, it was Constantinople's National Archive, so to speak. I think it was the Grand Archive or something like that. And um, it, it is believed to have been a repository of some of the same information, if not the same exact documents that had survived the sacking of the Library of Alexandria, okay? okay. And this would have been a treasure trove of what is now considered lost history, uh, uh, lost information on the world before known history. And, and any that would include in particular, any technologies developed. And, and um, from the sacking of Constantinople, uh, we end up having the opening of the new world. Okay, yes. that th this led, it led to the Renaissance, it led to the opening of the new world, because um, it has been demonstrated, uh, I think sufficiently, others would agree, that um, maps, called portalons, but um, mm -hmm. incredibly accurate maps for their era um, uh, with an accuracy that just if you follow the linear 
traditional history that were taught, there's just no way they should have been able to do such accurate cartography um, at the time that these maps were believed to have been made. This was um, some of the, the, the stuff that was captured during the Fourth Crusade from the archive in Constantinople. And this is how it is believed that um, the Templar uh, fleet captains and, and other European explorers got their hands, including Christopher Columbus, uh, eventually got their hands on these ancient maps. The Piri Rius map is an example of, you know, uh, what I'm talking about. And this is believed to uh, explain how um, the Templars and other Europeans knew about and traveled, were traveling to the Americas before the Americas were officially uh, announced by Spain. Um, that's a whole discussion there. Mm -hmm. But um, this could have been the source of um, uh, ancient texts, which could have included um, the kinds of technologies that Nimza was subsequent you know, to the Fourth Crusade. Um, interested in developing and could have been the same source that, that Peter Menace and members of the Sonora Aero Club, among others, um, could have gained knowledge of ancient technologies of the past to include whatever the Vimanas of ancient India were. Now, I personally, um, I find the mysteries and whatever the lost history is of the Americas, in particular South America and India, for me personally, uh, are the most fascinating historical mysteries as far as, you know, in geographical places, because I think anything you could point to, say, with the com to the Kham Empire, C-H-A-M, of Southeast Asia, um, which would have been subsequent to the lost history of India, th th this greatly um, would have been... Uh, stuff that emerged secretly or special knowledge from the lost history of India and, you know, perhaps made its way to South America or even some of it originated. You know, there is a theory that civilization didn't begin in Samaria. There's a theory that it began in the Americas and spread that way. And, you know, only later did the westward, you know, the, the move toward the Americas, you know, happen um, again, so to speak. Uh, but uh, going back to um, that, that thread, I think that this is where Nimza's pursuit of these exotic technologies comes from. I think definitely the Teutonic Knights, their scholars, their engineers, whatever, their scientists of the day got their hands on some, some what we would consider lost technology secrets and um, Nimza, what became Nimza in the 19th century, according to Delshaw, sometime between that Fourth Crusade and the, the rise of Nimza, whenever that was, the emergence of Nimza, um, this, was being, this was being passed through, um, you know, just what's, I'm losing the words here, uh, just passed down through secret societies, perhaps, or just very, to very select uh, people. And um, I think that's Nimza's source of it, is stuff that was captured during the Fourth Crusade. Hmm. So <clears throat> that's super interesting to me because um, you, I, I saw another interview where you talked about this habit among um, the, the Junkers of where they would infiltrate and then they would, um, people who sort of went against them, they would assassinate them. Yes. They held all manner of methods of manipulation. And what's interesting yes. to me about that is that, um, speaking of the Fourth Crusade, um, Enrico Dandolo, the, the great blind doge of uh, the Venetian black nobility, and uh, viewers of my show will know how I love to uh, pick on them as a, a source of quite a lot of the world's problems. Mm -hmm. um, at least in seed germ form, if not actively currently, which is my personal belief that they're still in operation and hidden, deeply hidden, and that that's actually the real ancient money families. Forget old money, ancient money. Um, Enrico Dandolo, he rerouted the crusade after tricking um, the knights that the Pope had sent to him. They were supposed to go down and sack Egypt, actually, to cut Egypt off of being able to supply 
the Holy Land. They were yeah, supposed that's what to do they that told, first. That's what they told the Templars. They they lied to the Templars. Mm-hmm. And they and they lied to the Pope too. And they said they were going to do that. And meanwhile, the nation black nobility, as they like to do, double dealed, and they told the Egyptian, "Hey, we're actually not going to come down there, and we're going to." Yeah. They got some kind of concession from them, some kind of something because they were always double dealing. And then they went over and instead used the crusading army to destroy a rival. Uh, in what I think would be like Croatia or something like that along the uh, opposite, the sort of the Gulf there uh, across from Venice. And they, they sacked that. And then that got the attention of actually some of these uh, German families who had a deposed um, emperor of Constantinople, who his brother had beat him out and kicked him out. And then they uh, got that German group to um, who was trying to back this guy who wanted his throne back to help the uh, uh, Venetians in order to have a reason to go into Constantinople. And some people think uh, Joseph Farrell, for instance, thinks that this was planned all along and yeah. that they then went into sack. And when you describe um, <clears throat> in other interviews elsewhere, this these machinations of these Junkers, it sounds an awful lot like the playbook that the Venetians would use to the point to where oh. mm -hmm. I can't help but wonder if, you know, it could just be a copy and paste. You see something good. You see someone use something that's effective. We see this a lot in modernity. Some sure. dictator sees another dictator has some really great repressive technique and they use it on their own. Sure. People, right. But that kind of the level of double dealing that you talk about with the Junkers and the way that they would penetrate these other groups sounds exactly like what these um, Florentine super companies, the uh, Peruzzi and the, and the Bardi company would do to get concessions from like the King of England and so forth. It's, it's sure. very similar to this kind of a Italian uh, method. Oh, please. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll depress you and the viewers. Um, I have a recommendation. If, <laughs> if you want to understand, in my opinion, mm -hmm. if you want to understand what happened to the United States through Operation Paperclip after yeah. World War II, I recommend you read a book, The Thousand Year Conspiracy by Paul Winkler. It was written in 1937 before World War II started, published in 1943 during the war. And in my opinion, it sadly, it lays out, in my opinion, exactly what the post-war Nazi milieu has done to the United States. And they did mm. it through Operation Paperclip. It matches exactly the formula we're talking about that they have done for centuries. And if you want a 20th century example of it, look at Homer Schacht, who Joseph Farrell also writes about. He was applying these exact things through the early 20th century and into Absolutely. the Nazi era. Um, but The Thousand Year Conspiracy by Paul Winkler, it's public domain. It's out there at Gutenberg Press, I think. And um, yeah, I, I, I do believe that that's what's happened to the United States. Through Operation Paperclip, they applied this and... So um, do you think, do you disturbing. think that, and, the, and this is a bit of a side from the subject at hand, but it is yeah. relevant to me and related. Do you think then that this um, German branch is independent and or a rival of the, of the, these uh, Italian oligarchies? Because there are competing factions, the Genoans, yeah. the Flor Florentines, and then the, um, sure. the Venetians seem to be the most nasty of all of them. Yeah, it's I think. Yeah, but they but the Venetians very and so did actually um, the Genoans. They very consciously moved up after the discovery of the New World to Holland and to England, and some of them moved up to Germany. And I mean, yes. Sax, Sax Coburg Gotha, the uh, you know the Windsors, right, who are mm -hmm. a branch of that. Sax Coburg Gotha is absolutely. I mean, it's Venetian black nobility mixed with Teutonic bloodlines or Junker bloodlines, right. like well. Go, go ahead. The Junkers, the Junker class, the, 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 the ones doing this, they, their sons and daughters intermarried among the sons and daughters of the Teutonic Knights. And so that, what you described is exactly what they did. And it, it's a perfect example. And sure, I have no doubt, you know, that, that um, what you're saying, of course, there's a, 
you know, there's ties, you know, with these genuine, of course, uh, it, mm-hmm. it, it fits the history. And it's exactly the kind of thing they would do. Now, I, when you, particularly when you read Winkler, and, and mm-hmm. you learn the history of what this Junker group was doing, it sounds like it was they, it, it could be they just as easily ingratiated themselves with the, you know, the genuine and the Florentine, you know, families and, and are doing their, their, their Prussian Junkers thing, mm-hmm. uh, their Teutonic thing, so to speak, um, mm-hmm. to them. So by now, yes, by the time we get to the, you know, the mid 20th century and into our times, the 21st century, of course, yeah, there's going to be an intertwining there. But um, it, it really corroborates what Joseph Farrell calls the Nazi International. And, right. Yes. Um, and and it's uh, uh, here's the interesting thing. It, it really resonates with what we're talking about because it's been in the post-World War II era that we're talking about Kecksburg and did the United States get their hand on hands on the right. Bell technology. All the things that we might be developing, our entire military industrial complex is an example of what Winkler's talking about. Who, who, who were the brains behind it? Not just American uh, industrialists, these Germans, uh, very Absolutely. Kurt Davis and all these other Germans, you go look right. at our military industrial complex companies and you have Operation Paperclip Germans right Absolutely. there. Von Braun, uh, you know, all of them were involved in our and, mm-hmm. and the American military industrial complex. Essentially, it's been done before by these right. Junkers through centuries. It's nothing new. I mm-hmm. see it as nothing short of an invasion a covert mm-hmm. invasion. And when you look at the very public assassination of JFK, right. And when you read what Winkler wrote in 1937 about this enforcer group that these Yunkers use, my God, mm-hmm. it's you under, it's like I said, if you want to understand what's happened to the United States since world war II, our political system, our financial mm-hmm. system and all of that read Winkler. Yeah. Oh, I, I absolutely agree with the um, Nazi international hypothesis for, for, for viewers who don't know. Oh, go ahead, Walter. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I wasn't sure. I wasn't as convinced as I am now until I read Winkler. When I read mm-hmm. Winkler, I realized, oh, my God, here's the here's the history to back up what people like Joseph and others have been saying. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to hear about that Nazi stuff, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, too you bad. You don't want to hear about it, but <laughs> too bad. The facts are the facts. Too bad. That's what's been done to us. Oh yeah, and and I don't, and I, I absolutely agree with that thesis. My question is that it seems to me when when I as I've been trying to figure out uh-huh. who runs the world, when I trace it back, I always go into banking, right? Like banking yeah. seems to be the linchpin, and when sure. you go into banking, the people who really perfected it are the Venetians, just period. Like they took that Templar mo- model of letters of credit and they added all kinds of layers of complexity. And then not only did they really master the banking, if they just mastered the banking, okay, maybe I would be like willing to say it's some other group, but they also like, they brought together the state intelligence, counterintelligence, um, they were, were doing futures. They were like had very modern in, in many, many ways, financial machinations. And they would use it to cripple all these groups around them until eventually the League of Cambrai came down and tried to wipe them out. And well, like- th- th- this is why in our times, mm-hmm. statism is pushed so hard on us because mm-hmm. thus control of the state is part of their controlling apparatus. Yes. They don't yeah. want national sovereignties because mm-hmm. sovereign nations are actually a check against global tyranny. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. You know, people say, "Oh, if you if you believe in sovereign nations, you're a fascist." Okay. Right. I'm I'm, I'm going to call you an <laughs> idiot if you say that because you're an idiot. You know, anyone who would say mm-hmm. that's an idiot, um, mm-hmm. falling for propaganda and stuff. Um, you know, they don't want that because statism is part of their control apparatus so yes. naturally they want us dependent on it and they want to push statism the state will take care of you that kind of thing and again to bring it back to what we're talking about this is something that they've been developing specifically this germanic tradition thread through all this has mm-hmm. been developing since the medieval era and sure it may not they might have got the idea probably you know like you said from some of the others you know you mentioned in italy and stuff but they have really mastered it 
and um, uh, the 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 acts, and it speaks to what happens when the access to knowing these historical secrets. You get your, you know, you have that access. Mm -hmm. You, you have your hands on that because it, it, the pursuit of developing that along the way, you're developing all sorts of not just um, uh, uh, technical technologies, but social technologies, yes. um, psychological technologies, you know, yeah. and, and on and so forth. And it all this, our modern world really began, you know, uh, from my perspective and others with the sacking of Constantinople. And I, I agree. The capturing of this lost, so so it always comes back to, okay, what the heck exactly was going on in our lost past? Mm -hmm. There, you know, and I'm a proponent of, again, the nugget of truth thing, like I said before. But I think there's a nugget of truth to the idea of an Atlantis, a mm -hmm. a, a, uh, a the Rama Empire, which right. you know, is mixed up in the Lemurian. I, I'm a great believer in, yeah, there, there was a technologically advanced period of, of Earth, you know, of our history, of human history, that for whatever reason uh, has been lost to us. Mm -hmm. And for centuries now, some of us, you know, um, have been, they've been aware of it to some extent, mm -hmm. and they've been trying to capture the information and reconstruct that right mm -hmm. um, i'm not the first guy to say this um, right and and that is where we find the origins of these groups we're talking about in particular the airship groups and whatever peter menace learned mm -hmm. um, it, it all goes back in my opinion to um what was captured at constantinople and before that what would have been captured in alexandria yes you know um, absolutely so it, what do you it, it, i'm going to throw you a curveball here walter what is mm -hmm. your opinion given we're talking about like anciently sourced flying machines i think would be the best umbrella term for this these conversations we've been having uh -huh. what do you think about blavatsky she talks about that she brought back from the east stuff and one of the things she talks about is like airships firebombing mm -hmm. cities as being sourced from ancient texts. I know she's a hyper, hyper controversial figure. And I know you're, you're much more grounded and brass tacks than I am. Uh, I'm, I'm a little more open to this sort of thing. I, I can't help but see that there's a little bit of a parallel. I mean, she was writing that stuff in the 1890s. Yes. And she talks about how there are, you know, legends among her supposed source in the East, which I have no idea whether that existed, that I'm dubious about. But some of the information that comes from that woman seems pretty solid to me. Not all of it. Some of it seems junky, but there's nuggets in there that are interesting. And one of the most interesting to me is she talks about ancient wars where flying machines were used to firebomb cities. Okay, well, um, I have no doubt that because of the nature of her interests and her pursuits throughout her adult life that she very likely you know got access to some texts that we would consider legitimate mm -hmm. um you know the idea of what she said about these wars you know this was readily available in you know the mahabharata you know which right. has been around for for centuries so that's true the, the problem i have with blavatsky is there's so much going against her credibility that mm -hmm. I, I think any credibility that's attributed to her is greatly exaggerated. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you won't find um, bits of valid information in her stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, on I, I'm going to use kind of a cynical flavored comment. I don't yeah. intend it to be that heavily cynical, but this is what con men do. They <laughs> yeah. take great pieces of the truth or, or they mix their BS with mm -hmm. just enough real things, legitimate, you know, sounding things or things that they can cite and point to, to, to make the rest of their BS convincing. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's the category that I see Blavatsky in is, you know, but, um, you know what they say, you know, the whole thing, it's similar to the, the, a broken clock is right twice a day. Right. You know, um, it, it's like, of course you're going to find some things, but it's not so much speaking to Blavatsky's credibility as it would speak to the credibility of where, of who she got that information from. 
Um, so I don't, I don't, so I certainly don't revere her or her work. Right. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I recognize that she very likely because of her pursuits could certainly have been exposed to legitimate information. So anything, in my opinion, anything legitimate that you can point to in Blavatsky um, isn't because of her. It's because of legitimate sources that she's, you know, repeating. Uh, and, and that's she, more or less my opinion as well. I'm not quite as harsh on her. I'm somewhere between uh, well, Daniel Liz's opinion of her. He seems to hold her in high regard and, yeah. and your opinion of her. I, I, I kind of, I have a mixed view, but I, I tend to agree that um, I, I guess the, the important and relevant bit is she brought forward some good information. Yes. Whether or not it was part of a long con, whether or not it was legitimate doesn't matter to me as much as that there's decent information there. And that's true about the Madhabharata. Her depiction seems slightly different than the way it's described in the Mahabharata. She might have sure. been drawing upon the fact that they had like hot air balloons and stuff by the time that she was alive. So she might have been taking the Mahabharata stories and kind of reconstituting them in a new form in order to make it a better oh, sell that yeah. it sounds like a mix of modernity and some ancient kind of thing. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So... so let me ask you another question. In part one, we talked we talked a lot about and and I love your theory, by the way, that the um, that the soup that um, Peter Menace was using had uh, an emerald base and a South American connection, and then like the Germans who had already by that point um, largely taken over Argentina, um, and there was other places where a lot of Germans settled in South America. And I think that's fascinating. However the whole mercury thing comes up quite a lot and I can't help but think of like cinnabar, right? Which is mercury before it's kind of broken apart is red in color. Yes. Um, and also, have you heard about the mercury pools that have been found beneath um, like the Mayan pyramids and especially the Chinese first emperor? Like right. that's wild to me. Like how do you find, it's, Yeah. how do you find the Chinese first emperor, right? Because he was smart enough to get rid of any history prior to right. him, right? And yeah. make the oh, year yeah. zero in China, yeah. even though China's clearly vastly older than oh, sure. the, the first emperor. But um, I think he's the yellow emperor, isn't that what he was called, right? The first, I can't remember. Anyway. Yeah, something like that, yeah. The first emperor of China, like for a long time, was almost legendary it's in, or mythical, like may have not existed. Well, they found his tomb finally in the past, I don't know, 70 years, something like that. And some yeah. of the stuff's pretty famous, like the terracotta warriors and stuff sure. have been brought out but what's less well known is there's apparently this giant pool or even river i've heard which i don't mm -hmm. understand that because that implies that there's some kind of circulation system or naturally occurring moving mercury which doesn't make any sense to me it seems like it's got to be artificial but this fact that mercury is revered with these high-ranking people like across the planet from each other because they found similar stuff under i want to say under the structures in uh, Teotihuacan, like the Temple of the Moon or, or the Pyramid of the Moon, uh, or one of the pyramids, and and look how how similar you could yeah. say nearly identical. The construction style of yes. Teotihuacan, what we're talking about, Teotihuacan, and those giant the giant pyramid in China. Yeah. So not only do you have the mercury pool connection, you've got the pyramid style that is very much the same. And, and uh, you know, I throw Cahokia in there, you uh -huh. know, um, uh, I don't think it's, uh, you know, I know some people get all whatever about it. Oh, it's a slight to Native Americans. No, no it's not. Um, uh, but I think a lost civilization is who actually built that giant pyramid at Cahokia. And mm -hmm. The, the any cultures we can point to of record that were there they you know much like the aztecs found mm -hmm. this giant pyramid and kind of moved into the property just like right. the teotihuacan teotihuacan is the aztec name for that they don't yeah. know anything about who the, the aztecs didn't know anything about who built that mysterious city down there in mm -hmm. Teotihuacan they just moved in and took it over so uh, mm -hmm. and like you say prior to the first known Chinese emperor these things existed and you know they found those mummies that are like what seven feet tall that they say are yeah. even with red hair that yes. for a long time China didn't want anyone to know was there. they found them in China too oh I thought yeah. you were talking about now in the like the mound builders 
like the Missouri mound, well, the mound builders too, but 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 yeah, in Chinese territory, they have found you know the report is that they have found these uh you know tall red haired Caucasians, and you know, for the longest time, of course, there's no way China right. has wanted anyone to know that there's somebody that you know is not Chinese, you know, mm -hmm. having having been there first. Yeah. That's fascinating. It's just, like, it's just like here, you know, you know, we pretty much now figure, yeah, the Vikings came here. And but th there's some evidence that um, some people say, you know, the Egyptians made it to the east coast of uh, South America. There's the again, the calm empire, mm -hmm. which, you know, was all over uh, the Pacific and, and California could have been uh, an outpost of the calm empire and and you know mm -hmm. there there were a chinese explorer there was at least a chinese explorer prior to 1492 who likely reached the shores of uh, north america i mean so this was i'm a great believer in the diffusion it, people were building boats and they were crossing those seas and you know absolutely this this denial of that is it's all politically motivated I, I agree. It's it's interesting. I've even heard that there's uh, reports of that there were, um, um, I forget what the word is, but something to show like the depth of a river, like channel markers, I think they're called, that uh -huh. were Egyptian that they found in the Mississippi and they just pulled the, all those puppies up. Um, you know, there's, there's right. reports, reasonably credible reports. Um, uh, uh, Timothy Hogan, who I mentioned before, said that yeah. he it's walled off now, but he went to where it is, where where there's um, supposedly Egyptian ruins, even outside the Grand Canyon, something that's Egyptian-esque. Yeah, I addressed this, uh, uh, both the Louisiana Territory mm -hmm. and that alleged reported Egyptian lost city in the Grand Canyon in my Secret Missions for the Esoteric Napoleon, Volume mm -hmm. 1. I'm working on volume two and I go mm -hmm. deeper into this. It is my opinion. And I, I talk about to this extent in my esoteric Napoleon book, um, there's something very much funny that was going on with history in the Louisiana territory. Um, what I didn't know until I dove into the research on the first book was that uh, two years before Napoleon sold the Louisiana territory to the United States, um, in a private, initially a private deal that he made with Thomas Jefferson. A lot of people don't know that Thomas Jefferson made the Louisiana purchase under executive order and Congress was pissed off at him. They said, you don't, the president doesn't have the authority to buy, you know, to make these purchases. But anyway, um, Napoleon, uh, it was the year before the Louisiana purchase was made by the United States. He ordered his um, secretary of the Navy Mm -hmm. I think it was to put together a team, keep it very secret, but send in an expedition throughout the Louisiana territory before mm -hmm. a year later, he offered it to the United States. We never hear anything about whether that expedition happened or not. I personally suspect it did. Mm -hmm. And I won't give away my huge hypothesis in Esoteric Napoleon Volume 1. I don't want to spoil it for readers. Yeah. But um, it, it naturally leads to a consideration of this so-called Egyptian city. I propose that it wasn't Egyptian. Uh, what it was was this calm empire culture. Mm -hmm. I, I think the ruin is there. I think the 1908 story happened. But I think it was described as Egyptian because there certainly would have been Egyptian cultural influences in this Kham empire, C-H-A-M. Um, and for lack of understanding of the Kham empire at that time, I think um, the witnesses talked about in this 1908 article about this city in the Grand Canyon, I think to their eye, remember, if you read the article, it, it, it doesn't flat out say, oh, it's definitely Egyptian. It, it kind of says, well, it's kind of Egyptian. It looks Egyptian. Well, mm -hmm. I think what they just didn't understand about the calm empire back then in 1908, the way we do today. So mm -hmm. I think that's what they found was evidence of the, the arrival of calm empire explorers uh, reaching the shores of North America, what we call California today, and um, going far enough inland that they reached our Grand, you know, the Grand Canyon. And, um, you know, whether it's a tomb or it was an outpost or whatever, 
that's what I propose in my esoteric Napoleon book. And um, that's the end of a thread that I will, I am pulling for volume two. So mm-hmm. what we're talking about right now about um, these very things I, I am following up on in the esoteric Napoleon volume two, which I hope to uh, uh, come out with by next year. And so I always try and have my shows be very conversational. So I'm actually quite pleased that we've gotten extra weird and down some bizarre rabbit holes here that seem completely unrelated to the the airships, to the viewer. But to me, all this stuff weaves together, actually, because it's clear to me that there was at least one, if not multiple, and I'm talking about fairly recent, meaning in the past 15,000 years, uh, Mm civilizations i mean one thing that uh viewers who are maybe watching this and haven't watched a bunch of my other stuff and i see this often is that they found that jawbone in morocco that's i think it's 325 or 350,000 years old that is a modern homo sapiens sapiens to where it's it's us and it's interesting they found it in morocco and not in the east africa where like for the longest time you know lucy and all the They were sure that like the earliest Homo sapiens sapiens modern humans came out of that. Now they're finding really crazy stuff like in Asia and also even in Europe that are like showing that perhaps even modern humans may have originated in Asia or Europe. Like it's no longer out of Africa is becoming up for debate based on some of this. But nonetheless, guaranteed one that's consensed upon agreed in science uh, in, in, well, uh, anthropology archaeological anthropology I, I forget exactly what you'd call it I guess anthropology for for when they find these fossils regardless the minimum age of humanity is 350,000 years now it's also a fossil now fossils are extremely rare uh, for for um, animals that aren't sea creatures sea creatures would die and sink to the mud at the bottom and whatever but Land animals are extremely rare because they generally have to get stuck in mud or tar or something like that right. and, and get stuck and die. And that's rare for even animals that we think are stupid, you know, like whatever kind of stupid animals fell into mud and got stuck. Even in that case, it's quite rare. But consider humans are a very social animal. And if one of us got stuck in a mud pit, more than likely the other humans in the group would try and get them out. So a human fossil almost presupposes a human that went off by itself and mm-hmm. fell into mud, right? Or, or something that would create a fossil. And so I would propose that as far as we know, we're the smartest thing on the, that's walked on this planet and that the odds of us falling in and fossilizing is extremely low, even compared to other animals. And so therefore that means that the absolute bare minimum age of humanity is 350,000 years old for modern Homo sapiens sapiens. Now, the the modern or or whatever mainstream history has us believe that we only stopped being hunter-gatherers and banging rocks together, and there's nothing wrong with that because it's the best template for survival, but that we only stumbled upon civilization in the past you know, what is it, 12,000 years? I mean, we have Gobekli Tepe or whatever, but maybe even 9,000 years, I think they try and say for modern agriculture. I mean, it's ludicrous. That's less than 0.3%, 0.03% of that 350,000 year block, which is, by the way, the youngest. And we just have increased over my lifetime alone. I want to say when I was a kid, it was 80,000 years old, we thought, for modern humans. But because of these finds of fossils, it's been pushed back to 350,000 years. As Graham Hancock likes to say, stuff keeps getting older. So the odds that we just stumbled upon civilization, the last 0.03% is virtually nil, in my opinion. Our civilization, our current civilization the level of our technology and stuff it's a rediscovery of civilization that we have built you know uh, something like it before it, mm-hmm. and 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 the one there might have been one before that that had fallen and was rebuilt and then fallen and rebuilt it's yeah i i agree it's it's it it's it seems to be a cycle and that brings to mind the very interesting um stuff that's talked about in um i think it might be the it, it, is it the uh vipers of venice or is it mm-hmm. babylon's banksters i think talking mm-hmm. about 
these cycles of the sun and civilization. And I mean, there you're talk about the word esoteric. You're really getting into an exotic discussion there on mm -hmm. why our civilization, why we have these cycles, you know, why right. we don't just as we develop, keep going, you know, most right. people it's like, Oh, human beings are awful. I'm not, a, by the way, I am not a misanthrope. Right. I cannot stand misanthropy. Um, it, 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 I, I think, I think it's lazy. Oh, we're just, we're unworthy humans. We're awful. We're, uh, you know, knock it off. <laughs> we're amazing. We, That's are, Malthusian. Are we no, but it's you, Malthusian you know. and it's, and it's a, it's a downward punching thing from the elites that actually tra it traces back to Rentes or whatever is like, at least that I know of this far back as it goes to Venetian who said, myth of carrying capacity and all this stuff i mean i do think that obviously like it's a finite planet at some point we do it i, I don't think we're doing a great job managing things but the very people who are pushing this meme of there's too many of us are the ones who are doing all the freaking damage and it doesn't need to be done that way technology doesn't have to be destructive and run counter to nature it just right. doesn't it just so happens that that's profitable and it's easy and it's something that sort of developed out of a certain milieu of of thinking that just didn't consider in any of those things. There's no reason why we can't have extremely high technology and repair environmental damage sure. in a reasonable way that isn't centralized, yeah. top-down Davos, great reset garbage. If we're able, if we have the minds and the capability to develop advanced technologies, certainly we can develop an advanced technology that's not as materially destructive. Right, yeah. And, 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 and I and, think civilizations in the past uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, were um, uh, more capable of that, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps. And uh, but then again, maybe not. You know, um, who, who knows? There, there, there's also the possibility that um, we are a nomadic race of beings that moves from world to world. And for yeah. however many hundreds of thousands of years we're on this planet, and when the resources are used up, we take the space technology that we've developed and we go somewhere else, and giving mm -hmm. that world that we've used up the resources the chance to reinvigorate and regrow. And because and mm -hmm. look at the look at the uh, rainforests. Remember when it was popular to oh my god look at the destruction of the rainforest and we'll never get that back. And the reason it's been pointed out, the reason you don't hear the rock stars and the movie stars whining and complaining about the rainforest destruction anymore, like they did, you know, 20 or whatever mm -hmm. years ago is because the fact is people did see the destruction and did realize, Oh shoot. Yeah, that's not good. So um, they, they started paying attention to it, but a lot of that has grown back uh, to, you know, it's not completely destroyed. It has grown back. It's very vibrant and, and very naturally geared towards survival and regeneration. Mm -hmm. So it might not have been, it, it suggests that it's not as dire as it's presented to us. We unfortunately are living in a time when it, it's they use chicken littleism they want to keep us in a constant state of fear and panic yeah. and they keep us in a constant state of mythanthropic self-loathing mm -hmm. and that's another way to control the masses yeah i i agree completely and and i think that uh, you know another thing is like they've shown in movies um especially like when when you make movies a lot of times people who are super restricted are able to be actually much more inventive and creative when they have restrictions of budget and so forth than sure. people when they have almost unlimited budgets, it ends up being crap because they're just like, throw money at it, throw money at it, throw money at it. Like, and well, they get kind of lazy. And, and so all I was gonna say, and I'll just wrap this real quick, is just that um, if we restricted ourselves to a more harmonious technology that worked with the earth, and we also put some effort into regeneration, you know, when I was a kid, do you remember Walter back when the blue whales almost got wiped out? Yes. And same thing with the bald eagles. I remember when I was a little boy, there was bald eagles nesting and all these cars stopped along the Columbia river and grown adults were crying and hugging each other because bald eagles were so rare Yeah, and that they were so ecstatic to see it. And all we had to do 
we didn't have to have some crazy extensive breeding program. We didn't have to do anything. We just banned DDT. And the eagles just came roaring back. And with yep. the blue whales, we just had an international moratorium stop killing the freaking blue whales for a minute. And they yeah. came back way better than the most optimistic projections. And we just have to take our foot off the accelerator. Of exactly. Death. And exactly. then it comes back. All we have to do is stop step back take a you know kind of readjust what we're doing and mm -hmm. yeah the regenerative nature of nature is amazing mm -hmm. it, it is truly it because because it's dis, you know it, it's it's it it's wiring it's engineering whatever you want to call it is geared for survival yeah. life it's yeah. it's life you know is going to win out you know, yeah. if, if you let it, you have to be completely, uh, you know, completely 100% um, insane with d destructive appetites to really crush life, you know, and, and this is why the, you know, our atomic weapon era really scared the hell out of us, you know, the way it did, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, in our known history, uh, the only mention of anything that destructive is going back to the Mahabharata. You know, which, mm -hmm. oh, gee, that's all myth. And then we realize, mm -hmm. oh, shoot, maybe it wasn't maybe. myth. And then what else wasn't myth right. in those, those writings? And, and, you know, there's some folks that, you know, in Western civilization, they want to write off Eastern civilization. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, don't get me wrong. I'm I, I very much a product of Western civilization. Mm -hmm. I like Western civilization. I do not me like too. the demonization of it. But it mm -hmm. doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. I right. think uh, there's secrets. There's secrets to this planet in our history with these tech exotic technologies and mysteries that we're going to find in the East that are screaming mm -hmm. at us. But we can't do this. Well, we're Western civilization, so that has no value. We must ignore it. Well, that's foolish. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, um, again, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Is, yeah. Is yeah, I, I completely agree. And, um, you know, it's interesting earlier, you mentioned like that cycle of the sun cycle. And that's, um, mm -hmm. I think it's Robert Schock talks about vitrification on stone, some of the ancient stone, uh -huh. there's evidence that there was some kind of like way beyond X class solar flare that comes out of the sun periodically. And uh, it, it, there's also the stick man on stone thing. I don't know if you've seen that where like, this stick man appears all over the world in petroglyphs and it looks yeah. exactly like a plasma uh, interaction yes. with a magnetic field. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I'm open to that theory. The other one that is interesting and appealing to me is Randall Carlson's theory about that periodically um, as we move around the edge of, you know, cause we're way out on the spiral arm of the Milky Way. We're, we're way yeah. on the edge of it, which might be a good thing actually, if yeah. there are extraterrestrials, which I believe there must be within our yeah, galaxy. It might be good that we're way out here. But yeah. as we move around the galaxy and what is called the astrological great year, that periodically we move through streams of um, uh, interstellar debris and that then it rains down like comets or it disturbs the still theoretical unproven Oort cloud, this cloud of icy bodies that's at way at the edge of our solar system. Um, and that so interesting, when it, whenever you move across the fixed signs, so like Aquarius and Leo or Taurus and Scorpio, that if you look, there's been these major events that um, you can look in the fossil record and see that there's been this huge destruction of life. Sure. And that's fascinating for a variety of reasons, especially when you consider um, Graham Hancock's hypothesis of the um, uh, Younger Dryas cometary impact. And that happens exactly on that cusp of uh, Leo. Mm -hmm. And so that would explain why there isn't evidence. I believe there is evidence, and we've talked about it a lot in both halves, but that's why people who claim there's no evidence of Atlantis or whatever, a prior uh, antediluvian like Ice Age civilization is another way of describing it that I like because it would have been during the Ice Age. There's no evidence of it, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's because we get if we get hit by like say this gigantic solar flare yeah. um if we had that happen right now it'd wipe out all our satellites it would fry all the electronics our superstructure would, would be gone and and we we modern humans would really struggle right yeah. but the oh yeah but the i shouldn't say modern humans humans living in 
extreme civilization would suffer. But you know yes. who would make it? Who people would make it are the people in Papua New Guinea, the people down in uh, the uh, rainforest down in Brazil and so forth. Oh, the yeah. last handful of people who are at least still keeping alive those traditional ways. That is the best template for survival for humans. That's why we have evidence of it in ancient times and we have it today, right? Whereas any kind of super complex civilization is uh, brittle and fragile in a certain kind of way because it's so interdependent on all these different specialized parts. I mean, very topical. Look at the supply chains are starting to have issues, which makes me more than a little anxious, you know, uh, with the just in time supply deliveries and so forth. We right now are starting to view a weakness in the system we have that is going to have crazy knock on effects. And <laughs> I don't want to go too down that rabbit hole, but um, yeah. since we're talking about ancient stuff, but it just shows how it's very possible that we could have had. I, I mean, my personal belief is. I think there was a civilization before Atlantis. And I think sure. there was probably a civilization before that. And we have names for it. Lemuria. I don't really like that one because it's lemurs and that weird guy in the 1800s. But sure, that's a right. decent way of describing it. Some Pacific oriented civilization. Well, th this, is, this is why I go more for, in that regard, the Rama Empire idea. Yes. Because, because the, the, much of the territory, when they talk about Le, the Lemurian thing, which really emerged during 19th century spiritualist era, um, mm -hmm. much of that is, is actually... Uh, uh, is predated by the idea and stories of the Rama Empire. Yes. So I, I think the obviously the 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 theosophist spiritualists who came up with the the lore of Lemuria, I think, were greatly influenced by their knowledge of the Rama Empire talked about, you know, in mm -hmm. uh, in in this particular literature, you know, the Mahabharata. I, I've never been able to pin down if the Rama Empire is contemporaneous to you know uh, atlantis as described by solon which seems to be our best source i mean there's the edfu building text um you know which uh, i talked about in um my interview with uh uh T tim hogan he went there and viewed those edfu building texts and for viewers who don't know uh at the temple of edfu they talk about how there was a uh, island to the west and it sank and then the, the gods came over and it's like clearly d discussing pre-dynastic Egypt and that they brought with them technology and how to build buildings and writing yeah. and all this kind of stuff and like Thoth is talked about and hermeticism and stuff comes from that and across the Atlantic you have the Mayans have almost the exact same story except the Atslan sank in the east and then there was refugees that came to the yeah, west nugget of truth we're talking about here. and it starts There's to you know it, it to me this most recent civilization seems i don't want to say indisputable that's just too strong but it seems really likely to me just for a whole host of reasons because i know the other thing is is that if you look at for example pre-dynastic egypt and early egypt it's at a very high level and then it descends it gets worse. It doesn't get better. Scholars have, you know, some scholars say that, um, you know, that the ancient classic ancient Egyptian civilization we're talking about was a legacy civilization. That, right. That, that the the uh, another advanced civilization, pretty much, um, almost like a colony. You know, boom, put it in place, and that's why it it you know degenerates. I you know I think it's possible. Um, that the Rama Empire predates what we call the Atlantis, you know, uh, let's say predates the Atlantis model. Some people, some people hypothesize that, you know, th there was a war between Atlantis and the Rama Empire because they were rivals. And, you know, too. this is what caused the fall and all this. But there's also the possibility, again, that the Rama Empire predates the Atlantis model. And, and you know, that could serve the uh, idea we were talking about how their their civilizations advanced civilizations have come and gone you yeah know? um so it uh, and and again in all of the we you know there's all sorts of possibilities and and different variations but essentially i think there is a nugget of truth to these ideas absolutely i, I, I do think that and i think that makes more sense than this linear you know thing mm -hmm. that that is thrown our way which is uh greatly if if i'm understanding it right has greatly been pushed on us since um the uh the um what i call the 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 bean counters of the royal society 
uh, finally outnumbered the philosopher scientists yeah. in 1830. And when they took over the Royal Societies in 1830, because they hated those philosopher scientists, because yeah, those okay. guys were smarter, more comprehensively <laughs> smarter and more knowledgeable than the bean counters. Science that we know today, and don't get me wrong, because I'm here alive because of the idea of specialist scientists, right? Mm -hmm. Because oncologists saved my life, you know, the, 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 the specialty scientist surgeon, you know, these guys aren't alchemists. I don't think Dr. <laughs> Don and Whelan are alchemists. I'll have to ask them, but, um, but, you know, <laughs> but, but essentially going back to that time, the, 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 the bean counters, so to speak, the, the specialist scientists, they hated these philosopher scientists because those guys had a comprehensive um, uh, curiosity yeah. and, and understanding of things. So they finally outnumbered them. And how, you know, back then, as the Royal Societies go, Western science follows. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, we emerged the, um, the, uh, the modern, uh, uh, pretty much atheistic, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, secular materialist world of science that we have today you 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 can point to that all important 1830 with the royal societies in england because that's really where the change in the scientific culture now yes the upside to that is look at what happened after that the industrial revolution really accelerated and we went look at our technology level in 1830 and then compare it to 1930 boom i mean we went shoom, mm -hmm. we rocketed you know no pun intended and then look at from 1930 to today mm -hmm. yeah the, the idea of the specialist technician scientist really carried our technology forward but what we've lost is um what the philosopher scientists brought to the table um one of the the most important thing being a more comprehensive understanding of what this has all been about Mm -hmm. um you know it, it's almost as if somebody didn't want the different specialists getting together to piece it all together to understand the big picture oh, they I, wanted to keep I think that's, separate i think that that's a hundred percent what happened and i think that atheism was pushed for occult reasons i have a whole i mean yeah. that could be its own entire show to be honest um i i i am certain that that was intentionally done and what i agree with you that technology took off in a certain way but i also wonder like would technology have gone maybe slower but in a more harmonious reasonable direction with holistic systems thinking rather than super like everything's a scalpel everything's a little pointer finger rather than you know what well, i mean it's uh, and 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 really you know uh uh you could almost say the story of 20th century technology is is uh, the story of warfare um, yeah, you know, the idea of the rise of the military industrial complex. Now, there's a, uh, a guy that I write books with a guy named Todd Wood, and he and I are doing mm -hmm. this series of books that we call the Lost Future series. And we have this mm -hmm. hypothesis. Again, other people have thought of a similar thing. We have this suspicion that um, in the late 19th century, you know, 1880s into the 1890s, mm -hmm. the, what, what was actually a much more harmonious brighter better vision going into the 20th century was usurped and suppressed for the uh banker globalist military industrial complex world that we got instead yep um and so yeah i kind of agree with what you say about where you know just because the technicians suppress the philosopher scientists look what those philosopher scientists were interested in it does does that mean that we wouldn't have had the industrial revolution and the technological mm -hmm. advancement the way we had it maybe not in the exact way but i argue that we certainly would because these philosopher scientists were some of the greatest engineers and and you know technicians you know that contributed so this idea that you know oh we have this better world ever since that change in science oh i disagree with that i i think there was a um a, a manipulation of the um the philosophy of the non-philosophical scientists if that makes sense it um, does uh, 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 you know by and materialism is a big part of that equation the, to me it it always comes down to these duplicitous um, conspiratorial, yep. um, globalist, 
guys with their hands on the money and their, yeah. you know, and, and the, this idea of these elitists, these people mm -hmm. that classify the masses as useless breeders, useless. Yeah. Breeders, you yeah. know, um, wow. Uh, talk about evil. Talk yeah. about arrogant, um, you know, and, and that greatly, that has greatly um, uh, exponentially magnified again since the late 19th century and all through the 20th century. So that's a byproduct of this, you know, um, alleged better approach to, you know, the sciences and technology. Um, and, and we also have no way of knowing, like we might be more advanced now, actually, if we'd kept the philosopher scientists yes. in charge with a hundred years more of development, we don't actually and, know. And a much more elegant, Mm -hmm. world in a way because but some people say oh walter that's silly it's a small no it's not look look at what we lost you know people look at the uh um the um oh my gosh the the like the the 1920s when architectural style really became this modern thing and yeah mm -hmm. you can look at examples of it back in the 20s and there was still an elegance then but mm -hmm. look at architecture by the time we get to the 1970s yeah Ugh. yep foxy Ugh. Yep. ugly ugly just absolutely yeah. ugly uh, they, they were advancing the industrial revolution but yet there was this elegance and beauty to architecture and, and every, every little thing. And we we've lost that. Yeah. It's become utilitarian and hard. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's utilitarian and money-based. It's all bean yeah. counting and utilitarian, but we're like, okay, well, what's the cheapest way to make the structure and, yeah. and how can we make it the most profitable rather yeah. than, you know, exactly. what about some aesthetics? What about beauty? You and know, then what, what happens, a, you, yeah. you take away, human beings, even the, 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 the common man and woman, the common person, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the, the working class and, and all that, if they see an elegant, you know, beauty around them, that's more uplifting. That's yeah. more encouraging, um, particularly in a free society where you can move up and down the class level, um, which, you know, we have basically, <laughs> um, yeah they, they there's been issues with people screwing with that of course but yeah. then you know when you have ugliness around you yeah and grabness um that's not uplifting in that subconscious level and right. and again i agree with you of course that was done on purpose right of course yep. let's give them ugly straight-sided boxes to look at let's just keep their spirit down 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 which bringing it back to what we're talking about earlier um I think that's part of the the black magic, if you will, yes. of the JFK assassination, for example. Yes. The JFK assassination, and then you follow it up with the other ugly assassinations of the 60s, MLK and mm -hmm. and you know, Robert Kennedy and stuff. But I, you know, I would be as bold and I say this in my I think in origin even. Mm -hmm. Um look at the 1986 Challenger disaster and think mm -hmm. about it hypothetically as sabotage. Mm -hmm. Here, the one thing that America had that we, we achieved this amazing success that no matter how up and down things went in the 70s, we were always proud of our space program. Right. Okay? And going into the 80s, you know, um, the, the culture in the United States, it, it was getting to be okay again to like the country and our culture and everything. Mm -hmm. But if they wanted to deal a blow to our collective psyche, um, like they did with the JFK assassination, and it did deal a blow to the American psyche, uh, you know, 23 years later, they needed to do that again. Mm -hmm. Maybe the '86 Challenger disaster and Krista McCullough, like yeah, the teacher, there it is, sweet little televised. teacher, and she's going to teach the kids. I, I oh, didn't see it food. live, but I was, you know, I was in, I think, fourth grade when it happened. The fifth yeah. graders were watching, and all of a sudden, the fifth graders spilled out into the halls and were making all yeah. this noise. And our teacher was like, "Whoa, why are there kids in the hall?" Row, 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 and he went out yeah. there, and then he just disappeared. Our teacher just straight up disappeared, and we we're like, "What?" And some of the fifth graders were milling about and we we're like, hey guys, what's up? And they were like, it blew up. And I was like, what do you mean it blew up? And they were like, the space shuttle. And I was like, you're lying. 
You know, I remember this clear as yeah. day and they were like, no, no, it really blew up. And then we saw teachers were off in the corners and they were all like hands. Well, you know, I was, and it was I like was 9 too, 11, you know, I was, I was too young to be able to remember the fire, you know, the Apollo one fire on the launch mm -hmm. pad. So you and I are in those generations where we grew up with, we put men on the moon and we went there multiple times and we put people in space and no one gets killed, you know, during the period of those years. Uh -huh. So the Challenger disaster for us, our, you know, uh -huh. respective age groups, that uh -huh. was a, a shock to us because, yeah. whoa, wait a minute, you know, it's dangerous. And, and it was such a spectacular, you know, event in, in that bad way, you know, mm -hmm. that um, it, it, it was kind of, you know, a little blow. And um, so, it derailed the space program too, like that legacy space program. And to bring it back to part one, and it was something yeah. I wanted to touch on, you know, there's this theory out there, um, you know, we're about to touch on the subject to where no matter what we say, we're going to lose part of the audience. And yeah. I don't care. And okay. that is, that is, I agree with you and Joseph Farrell that it, it's not that we didn't go. It's not that we did go the way they say. But instead, it's that how we got there and Bingo. how we got back Bingo. is the big secret around the moon. Yeah. And the reason I think that theory is correct is because it ties in with all this stuff about the secret space program and the clandestine space program. Sure. I just want to take a quick second, viewers. One thing you should understand is that when Walter and others were, were um, coming together, all these great researchers, and they were having these secret space program conferences, the first one was what, in 2011? Is that correct? 2010, maybe? Yeah, 2011. The first one I went to was 2014. Uh -huh. I didn't speak at that one, but yeah. Yeah, and, and then Walter on. speaks uh, spoke in uh, 2015. And if you want to go really deep, Walter has a whole presentation with slides and so forth. Look up the secret space program, 2015. Watch it all at a bare minimum watch Walters and watch Michael Schratz. Uh, Paul LaViolette is also really amazing. And Dr. Joseph Rowe, you could watch him talk about anything and you'll be riveted if you're like me yeah. anyway. So, but if you watch those, you will see that it's very grounded. And it's this thing that I said at the beginning of this episode that I'm in the personal belief that the vast majority of what is seen in the sky is uh, ultra tech. It's hidden technology sure. that humans have. That yeah. I'm of the opinion, like Walter, that it's been recovered, it's recovered, redeveloped, and it's probably developed on its own. Mm -hmm. Is there some amount of reverse engineered extraterrestrial stuff? Sure, sure, there might be a bit of that. I'm open to it. But I think that it's far more plausible. It's less sexy in a way, but it makes more sense mm -hmm. that it is this human developed technology, even if it's recovered ancient. I mean, like. Walter and I are saying earlier, there were, there's probably been at least one, I feel super confident, as confident as I can about something that's speculative like this, that at least Atlantis, and whether or not that was contemporaneous with Rama, but Atlantis and the Empire of Rama both feel real to me. I feel like there's sufficient circumstantial evidence. Also, keep in mind, during the Ice Ages, the sea level would have been, you know, 150, 250 feet lower. And where do humans like to live? We like to live along rivers and we like to live along ocean yeah. because it makes trade easy. There's also yes. plentiful food sources. So like during that big tsunami in 2007, there was uh, Indian fishermen who were fishing right on the continental shelf because all this material comes up from the deep ocean and fish like to feed there and there's fishermen fishing there. And when, yeah. the, when the water went out for the tsunami, they saw temples all over the place. And I've heard reports that the similar things were seen along the coast of China. I've never been able, I just heard that from one person who was in China at the time when it happened. I've never been able to run that down. It's always difficult to find any information out of China, yeah. but you know that may be where a lot of the ruins are is underwater along the continental sure. shelf or Makes you know sense. uh daniel liz who we've referenced a number of times he likes to talk about the hot zone down in uh the bermuda triangle area and that there could oh, yeah. be yeah. some there could be something there and that would mesh with some of the stuff about atlantis and where it would have been in between you know someplace between the mayans and the egyptians you know i, I think it's somewhere in the atlantic north atlantic ridge um, or not North Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my personal belief, but it doesn't really matter. Point is, is that the evidence of this could be out there and people who have access to this ancient knowledge like they got from the Fourth Crusade, 
elites who are smart are going to keep that under wraps and try and get more and more and more for themselves and then redevelop it. And so I am of the personal opinion that yes, we landed on the moon, but that we use some kind of advanced technology. And, and yeah. Walter, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because, um, well, people, um, I've done it. Joseph has done it. Um, they, they point to the footage of the lunar module when it's leaving the moon, mm -hmm. the, you know, and naysayers to this high speculation, you know, naysayers to it will say, well, that's because of the reduced gravity and blah, blah, blah. But it has this weird look, not like it was pushed off with rocket power, but like it just kind of pops off. It, it pops off. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way. That's, that's a very good way to put it. Like, like, a latch was released and yeah. it, 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 it pops off. And so one might argue that, okay, was there some type of anti-gravity assist, an assist mm -hmm. that was used in the, the Apollo program? Now you say, oh, that's Buck Rogers stuff, but go back to what I said in the, the first hour that mm -hmm. we talked, um, the first interview, um, that in 1958, suddenly very public technological discussions of the exploration and development of anti-gravity research, suddenly a lid clamps down on it. And 1958 is the year that in October, the United States founds and stands up NASA. Mm. And NASA, of course, is the organization that, you know, went to the moon, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the public, you know, I believe, mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, there's classified stuff related to going to the moon, but that we don't have time to get into that. But mm -hmm. the, 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 the point is, you know, it's just, you know, is that coincidence or is that, you know, a meaningful coincidence there? Mm -hmm. um, and then we have years later, we know that uh, concepts and principles of electrogravitics were applied to the B2 for anti-gravity type assist in that aircraft in the 90s so golly anti-gravity research yeah a lids clamped down on it in 1958 the year that our space agency is stood up mm -hmm. and then in the 90s we have anti-gravity assist that you know is discussed openly with our b2 gee you think we were doing something with it in those intervening years yeah and particularly mm -hmm. was nasa doing something with it to me, that's potentially a no-brainer as far as if you're going to speculate and hypothesize. So um, that, that, yeah, I think there are, uh, what they're not telling us about Apollo and the moon landings, uh, uh, there's a couple of aspects. It's how we got there and how we got back. And that includes how we dealt with the Van Allen belts. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the naysayer, the Van Allen belts, we would burn right up if we went through those. <laughs> and they don't do, they don't do two minutes of reading on how mm -hmm. the Van Allen belts we, that was figured out fairly simply and they they got mm -hmm. around that easy but mm -hmm. um uh, uh but anyway um it, it, you know I in in how we got there and, and you know the transporting to and from the moon is is half of the the story the other half of the secret story I think yeah is what they saw there yeah I don't think we've been told the whole story about what was seen or found now that said i neither do i believe you know when you hear these these popular you know uh, alleged you know what is that or uh, you know these alleged things that armstrong and them said mm -hmm. um there's reasons to question the popular stuff but going back to nugget of truth you know i do think that there are things found by the apollo uh, uh crews that landed that we're not told about so um but but as far as we went i i think denying the moon landings i equate with flat earthers and it, it's which is utterly ridiculous and it, to me the flat earth thing is so ridiculous that i've suspected mm -hmm. that it's been a joke it's a uh, psyops i think i think it's a tavistock psyops yeah, to discredit it, people uh, like us who are at least trying to be grounded you know, like, obviously, we're talking about very outside the norm stuff, although I've been interested in this sort of thing for 20, 30, 40 years, and it's uh -huh. super popular now compared yeah. to when I was a kid and looking, sure. 
into this stuff, you know, like the Tekuns or whatever Tongas, whatever that blast that happened over Russia that now think, was it? Yeah. yeah, the Tunguska blast, you know, and some people say right. it was maybe Tesla's uh, death ray, you know, bouncing sure. off the magnetosphere or something like that. Um, you know, I've been interested in this kind of weird and anomalous stuff since I was a kid, and it's kind of it's kind of sexy now a little bit. The whole conspiracy thing. The problem with that is is that as things became more sexy. Um, there's been a lot of both people who are just trying to make a buck and the most outrageous thing you can say is going to make you have more money because you're going to get more clicks and more eyeballs and more advertising. Yeah. But there is also a darker hand at play, I believe, because if you suppose just for hy hypothesis sake that Walter and I and, and others who've done this research um, are correct and that there is indeed extremely advanced technology that's hidden. I'm actually going to share a personal story real quick. Back in 2001, before 9-11, I had a guy describe for me the iPad exactly, except for he added flexibility to it. And mind you, like, there was nothing like that. There was no touch screen right. graphical interface thing like that. But this guy described to me exactly the iPad. He said, there's only going to be one button on it. And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, and you're going to be able to do everything touching and like all the programs will be you just touch it and up will come the thing you want. And it's going to be completely right. visual and you'll be able to go around with it. And he's like, and it'll be incredible. Like you'll be able to have a computer that you can take any, everywhere and it'll all be like a touch screen. And I was like trying to wrap my head around what this guy was describing. And it was so weird. And it was seven years later when the iPhone came out before the iPad. But mm -hmm. He described it to me exactly, and he said, yeah, my friend in um, British intelligence in the military has told me about this thing. And I had another guy who told me about um, that he had seen in the 90s, basically an iPhone, in the early 90s, that he was part of um, some special forces thing and that he had seen an iPhone. And if it hadn't been for this other story that happened prior to me, yeah. Uh, prior to it coming out, I wouldn't have given any credence to it because by that point the iPhone was out, but I was just having a conversation with the guy and he said, you know, when I was in special forces in the nineties, we had basically iPhones. So the point of that story is, is that, you know, there's, it's pretty commonly known and most people will agree in this, even very narrow minded folks will agree that there's technology that the government intelligence and military organizations have that's sure at least 20 years beyond what we have right now. Oh yeah, yeah. What, what, what isn't, shouldn't then be a big stretch is, is there technology that's 50 years beyond what we have that's in, wrapped up in black projects that then it filters down to where these intelligence and military people like that guy said it? Like, is it possible then that there was an iPhone or something akin to it in the 80s? I don't think that then it's too big of a stretch. And so the power in all this stuff is not just the technology itself, but it's in keeping it hidden. It's the same way that the Venetians, it seems, tried to suppress knowledge of the new world, that they almost certainly got it in the Fourth sure. Crusade, and yeah. they didn't want it because they would it, just geographically, it would have been bad because they wouldn't have been able to take advantage of it at the time. And so when this kind of knowledge comes, uh, is discovered, elites have a desire, it seems, and this seems to repeat this pattern in history of putting a lid on it until they can figure out how to exploit it, or they can no longer keep the lid on it and it breaks out. Well, I, I think in, in, to, to piggyback on that, finer point mm -hmm. on it, I think that they secretly, those with the, the knowledge post mm -hmm. Fourth Crusade, um, uh, you know, the, those with the knowledge of the Americas uh, certainly exploited it secretly and in the and to the extent that they could, keeping it secret. But then it reached a point where they wanted to definitely exploit it much further. So then it was time. What would they need back then? Manpower. So hey, we need mm -hmm. to really fully exploit these continents. Okay, time to open it up and say we just discovered it you know, so that we'll get that manpower to want to go there. So mm -hmm. I think that's why they, uh, uh, you know, you know, the whole thing about Columbus's discovery was staged. I mean, most people, 
you know, mm-hmm. that look at that for five minutes, realize, okay, yeah, that was that, you know, and, and I talk about that in a couple of my books, I talk about it in Secret Missions 5, the hypotheses that are out there that, you know, this was all the, the, the Columbus's discovery was this big staged event and why, and, and it makes sense. And I think it's because it was time to fully exploit the American continents and mm-hmm. they needed the manpower. And yeah. that's how they got the man funding, open it up to the masses. And then mm-hmm. there you go. Right. And so there's that pattern of you, you, it's something, there's a discovery, either whether it's ancient or it's a technological breakthrough or whatever, right? Like mm-hmm. the Germans were looking at plasma physics and then whoop, goes away yeah. and then like seems to maybe reappear. Start showing up in things, things. Start showing up elsewhere. Yeah. And yeah. so this pattern repeats itself enough that I don't think it's that big of a stretch. And by the way, when Walter talks about a lib being put on anti-gravity, watch that Michael Schratt, uh, uh, gosh, what is it called? Lecture from the Secret Space Program 2015. That guy is a genius of like having done research. Just it's all open source, but it's very obscure, very dry. His analyses uh, are are top-notch it, it, they, and they're logical sure. you look at it and you go wow okay yes yeah, sure. I, I know i don't see how anyone could watch that michael stratt presentation and not come away with it and go well we got a we got another parallel space program we got a breakaway yep. civilization there's just no doubt about it i mean that that was literally what i came away from watching that was that i was completely convinced and he shows all these clippings from the 50s hiring people for electrogravitics, hiring people for anti-gravity, those two in particular, there was a lot of things to where they were putting it out there. And this was back when um, the military industrial complex hadn't reached the level of consolidation we have now too, I think is part of it. So there was a lot of little smaller little companies that were hiring people and they were trying to find talent. And so they were putting ads out in different like scientific publications and so forth because they were looking for that guy in his garage who was a genius uh who had maybe stumbled upon something and they were trying to find those people in those days not to kill him but to bring them actually in under the wing and start to develop these technologies and then it just disappears and it all of a sudden became a joke and even if you watch some of like the popular culture of that time it seemed inevitable that we were going to have anti-gravity stuff like the jetsons that sort of thing you know, like all the flying cars that appear to be also, they're not flying, they, they hover, they stop in traffic, they literally make jokes about traffic. So they're hovering in the Jetsons. They're not, it's not a propulsion based thing where right. they're using aerodynamics of a wing. It's right. clear that it's hovering. So it was like, it was almost like they were preparing society back then, it seems, for the, the release of anti-gravity. And then someone said, nope, not doing that. Yeah. And so, yeah, um, boy, it, this has been an amazing conversation. It's like a dream come true to get to talk to you, Walter, about oh, all hey. this stuff. But out of fairness to you and your time, we've gone way over here. And so um, I would love to have you back. Um, it's sure. been fantastic. And we can talk about whatever, just like we did today, because it, it went off the rails. But in my opinion, in the best way possible. Oh, yeah, that's you, you so, just kind of get the conversation going and and you you let it lead you you let it i I really prefer that i mean like um you know i watched an interview you did with someone and it was super well structured and i was like wow and then i was like you know we started to get into it and i was like you know what i just like where this is flowing and i like the organic nature and you know is a bit like the difference that we're talking about between the specialized super narrowed in science versus holistic i feel like this second episode was very holistic and that we covered a bunch of stuff that at first blush might seem unrelated but there's a reason that walter and i are pulling all these threads of like the chem empire which i'm going to have to look into that now um or like you know going from the fourth crusade to the nazis to whatever there is one more question i want to or two more questions i want to ask walter but go ahead you're you're raising your finger i was just going to say in the Mm com empire um david childress has done a really Uh, good comprehensive uh book on that to to give you the basics and the understanding of what the com empire uh mm -hmm. actually was and it's not some frivolous uh uh you know fantasy type idea empire no it's 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 one of his best books and it's it's very Mm -hmm. rooted in historical facts and and stuff um but it i think you'll find it very informative and very enlightening 
on these things we've been talking about, and particularly some of these mysteries of architecture and, and you know, uh, ancient visitors to the Americas and so forth. Yeah, I think you'll find it uh, really so interesting. I have, I have two final questions just uh -huh. to wrap up that they're just completely random. And okay. so one of them's, well, I mean, they're both very speculative. Much of what we talked about is extremely speculative. So there's the famous UFO incident where, which to me is the most mind boggling thing that this is not well known, but that is all those UFOs appearing over the White House. And I want to say it was around 58 or 59. It was in the fifties at some point. You it know was that in one, 50, right? I think it was in 52. Was it really that early? Okay. I, I think it was the early fifties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'd have to look it up, but it's weird to me that this isn't, uh, I mean, like when I finally discovered this, you know, I've only discovered it in the 21st century. I was like, how in the world is this not just super common knowledge? It's like that battle of Los Angeles uh, mm -hmm. sighting at, during the midst of world war II, where they saw this orb up in the sky and they even hammered at it with anti-aircraft guns and like, it didn't do anything. And then it just left. And like thousands upon thousands of people saw that one, but the same thing with this one over the White House. Do you think that that was then this Nazi international sending a message? Do you think that's what it is? And that that's kind of what I'm inclined to think. I I, I will say that it's. I'm going to put it in the realm of possibility. Yeah. Another possibility is it was ourselves. Ah. Um, somebody within our own structure uh doing Do you think something. they were trying to lean on eisenhower or something like a show of force or something like that it's or, possible because when yeah. we think of eisenhower's little public address comment about right. being aware of the military industrial complex mm -hmm. you know and then he gets out of office and you know the mm -hmm. very next guy to buck that whole thing look what happens to him Mm -hmm. um right <laughs> so yeah i i you know what I, and i know this is some people are gonna say you know that darn bosley but mm -hmm. um I, that what you're talking about that incident over the i think it was over the capitol building um mm -hmm. i don't think don't look to et for the answer to that i i think there's a, a different that i think the answer lies elsewhere to that and um i know it's not as fun mm -hmm. but it's you know at some point i i say to people on my channel i say at some point you know we must grow up we must be mm -hmm. adults you know and um it, it it's not always going to be that thing you know you you want it to be it's not always going to be et in fact with ufos it's looking like it's very rare that it would be et and and i and i and i think walter agrees with this um you know I do believe that there's without question extraterrestrials. Oh, in the I, I agree. That's with beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I'll even here. take it a step further. Yeah. I believe that there's, did you say that? And they've come here. Yeah. I think they've yeah. come here. Yeah, yeah. Same. Exactly. And, and I think that um, there could even be active involvement by extraterrestrials. But what I think though, is that the vast majority of the time when we see them, it's humans. And part of the reason I think that is, is I think that if you have the ability to travel interstellar, it would be a piece of cake to be invisible yeah. to us, to our naked sure. eye. Good a point. piece of cake. Oh, and let's clarify further. Yeah. We we're saying, you know, 90, I say 90%, you say 95%, we see these things, it's human. Mm -hmm. I say earth-based human, because I think yeah. there are human beings exactly like us from other worlds. This idea that humans like us could only have originated and developed here I, I, mm -hmm. come on that's naive you know I, if we develop here if then certainly there is going there are going to be other worlds just like earth and there's going to be human beings exactly like us um, there's that idea of the morphogenic field to where whenever a template bursts into creation that then it tends to repeat itself and there's a yes. little bit of evidence here on earth with crab evolution apparently yeah. there's been five separate species that have all evolved into something that is a, a crab basically they didn't start that way most of them were kind of crab-ish they were shrimp or lobster but there was at least one species that was quite different and over time it evolved into one of the crab species we have now so that shape just comes up again and again and there's an esoteric ish theory of this morphogenic field that there's this potentiality and when things come into existence sure. once it's come into existence 
that template is now available for use. And this idea of two arms, a head, and two legs, and with the torso is something that apparently is like a, a marker of a more advanced intelligent being. And so I also even would take it a step further. I agree with Walter. I think that humans on earth are probably related to another spacefaring species that has come here before in deep antiquity and either got involved in a war here and got stuck here or came here to colonize and we've forgotten it except for maybe the elites might know it. Go ahead. I, I, think, I think the idea that, mm -hmm. that people, in my opinion, erroneously embrace that humans like us can only develop here. I mm -hmm. think that's a result of purposeful suppression. I think the idea of the greys and the aliens that are not like us is mm -hmm. pushed by the very people who don't want us to realize that there are human extraterrestrials coming to this planet, okay? Because think about how easy they could move among us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. somebody would not want us to know that people were passing on the street in any given city or place could be from another planet. And there's that, you know, there's that, um, the whole Nordic species of aliens during the contact era very right? very similar to nordic uh, now some European. people could argue and have that that phase of the contact era where we heard these stories is um is uh evidence that this actually was earth technology and they were masquerading as space people but mm -hmm. let's go let, let's let's throw the et folks a bone mm -hmm. what if it was extraterrestrial humans and through the 50s, they were doing that. And when it was decided, hey, wait a minute, we kind of want to cover and suppress our presence here. So then what if they then started pushing the, oh, no, extraterrestrials can only be little grays or purple beings with three heads. They can't, po they couldn't possibly be human. You know, mm -hmm. um, th there, there's there's an argument to be made that uh, mm -hmm. and what you were talking about with the the, the biological argument. Mm -hmm. that very much you know evidence in that regard that that mm -hmm. we are a template that that there are humans all over the place and again mm -hmm. the idea that they could come here and move among us uh, would probably some people you know some people get scared at the drop of a hat in their own shadows mm -hmm. and there's going to be some people who that would freak them out mm -hmm. you know um but it, it you got to look at human beings from other planets there's nothing it, it, it's there's not going to be anything mystical about that. It's just like if you lived on, if you were one of the in, indigenous native peoples of this continent, when the Europeans or, or someone from Africa or someone from an Asian, uh, you know, yeah. the Asian continent came over to this mm -hmm. continent, they're human beings. Now they dress different. They might not have the same features as you. Their, their, their boats mm -hmm. look different or whatever, but they're still human beings that are just from another continent. I equate when we encounter humans that are from other planets, it's just going to be a, just a grander equivalent of that. They just happen and, to. And it could be like, it could be the way you have a mule, you have like a horse and a donkey, which are very similar. They're similar enough to breed, but then they have a sterile offspring or, or a liger, right? A lion and tiger yeah. breed, and yeah. then they have a sterile offspring. It yeah. could be, it could be like that we're that close, but not quite enough to have like yeah. a viable offspring. Or it could even be that they're like, enough different that we couldn't breed with them but they still look quite a bit like us i think we're going to encounter humans that we can interbreed with because we are exactly the same species that's interesting well i i mean i think that that's certainly possible i also like have wondered if we're not like spliced with uh you know primates that that that's something very akin to us sure spliced you know that's that whole sitchin thing and i don't really and, like and, sitchin but there's also feels like there's a nugget in sitchin's theory and why couldn't that have been done on countless other earth-like worlds? right uh, right know. right and i mean that's another theory of why um you know i'm of the opinion and then i'll ask you one last question before we wrap up here and thank you so much for your generosity with your time walter it's been a pleasure um i'm also a a, a bit inclined to think that something is causing the elites of this world to behave in what to me is a very sloppy manner after decades or centuries of being extremely clever and really mastering that boiling frog, slow yeah. creeping control. And it's 
there's either they're either utterly certain and i think in which case hubris is getting the best of them that's a wow. simple occam's razor explanation that they just are filled with hubris and they think we have all this tech who can stop us we're going to create this nasty global government or i sense and this is more an intuitive feeling than a logical one there's something that is causing them to act out of desperation mm-hmm with a timeline and it seems like that timeline seems to be 2030 specifically and there's the theory randall carlson and graham hancock say that we're going to be bombarded by uh extrasolar matter and that's you know like comets or asteroids or whatever yeah and that that's what they're working with that they know that that they know that we're about to get have some kind of aerial bombardment or it could be that they know a big blast is coming from the sun right so it's something that's more i don't know dead matter kind of based or another theory that some people have is that whatever is like us that's out there is coming, coming back yeah and their technology will absolutely slap our technology but also maybe enough is known about them that their philosophy is in opposition to these Mm -hmm. elitists that we have here and they know they're in for a butt whipping yeah Mm -hmm. and it could be that they're not friendly or it could be that they are more harmonious and they'll come here and they'll go whoa yeah you're not and dad have been gone for the weekend it looks like you guys had a party here and the house is trash and 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 you're being a-holes to your masses Uh, we're not going to stand for that or yeah very possibly too there Mm -hmm. could be a very nasty group on -hmm. its way here that scares the hell out of people Mm -hmm. that are kind of in the know i mean mean, we could be uh facing the, you know the arrival of um you know some type of conquest mm-hmm. you know and and i know there's people that uh, mm-hmm. uh th- this is another discussion we'll have to have at another time because i've mm-hmm. talked about this it's one of my pet peeves the warner von braun they call it the deathbed confession but it really wasn't a deathbed confession mm-hmm. you know um the misinterpretation i believe of what warner von braun said that the alien threat was a lie oh I, I disagree yeah. with that. I, I think the 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 exploitation of an extraterrestrial threat, the elements of that exploitation to control us is the lie. I don't think that space is peopled only with with peaceful, loving civilizations, and there is no threat from space. I think that is the most childish, naive nonsense that that is out there in the ufology community today it's just (laughs) absolutely childish well and there could be something ugly on its way here well i i actually am going to push back on that just a little bit and here's why i think that if you have look at the way we talked about 20th century to where it's like really uh Uh war-based technology and how rapidly technology develops with war. Now, if you imagine that there's other species out there, whether they look like us or not, doesn't matter, and they are very aggressive the way we are, there's a decent chance you're always rolling the dice that you're going to nuke yourselves back to the Stone Age and not get off the planet, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would actually think that a more harmonious civilization, it might take longer in time, but it would be a more certain route off the planet. Whereas a hyper aggressive species that wants to enslave itself and fight all the time because of inter internecine conflict between elites would be more likely to bomb itself back to the Stone Age or otherwise be difficult to get off the planet because the only way you get off the planet then is if you have some kind of planetary Third Reich, you know, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like some kind of top down extreme control slavery i mean this great reset thing they're trying to build is pretty akin to that and that's the way you get off the planet but you don't get off the planet until you put the clamps down on the entirety of the planet and then you move off it if you're in a very aggressive species where if you're a more harmonious species you're more certain to get off the planet because you're less likely to blow blow yourselves back to the stone age repeatedly so i'm of the personal belief that actually probably there's more harmonious uh, races and civilizations out there and there's less aggressive ones. But I bet those aggressive ones are hyper aggressive and hyper nasty. That's just my personal belief, but you, well, I, I, you don't have to agree with me. <laughs> what, one thing is 
you know, it, it, it only takes one, you know, an aggressive yeah. one that, that could, that could reach us to wreak the hyper predator. Number two, yeah. we just said earlier, we're at the edge mm -hmm. of this particular galaxy. I mean, uh, if you went, you went back in time and observed how many mm -hmm. centuries of relative, uh, uh, peace and autonomy and not worrying about outside invaders how many centuries of that went on here in the americas with the native yeah. peoples before europeans arrived and really were a-holes to them and did all this the spanish conquest if from yeah. their perspective it'd be like oh you know the people across the ocean they're probably peaceful because <laughs> yeah. gee we haven't been conquered yet we haven't been invaded yet but eventually right. it did happen i think we're in one of those periods where we're just in between yeah, and just like our society has fallen into this soft post-World War II lull, <laughs> um, yeah. I think humanity on this planet has fallen into that. The mm -hmm. golly, there, there's not anything bad out there because it would have certainly it would have shown itself by now. Well, right. in the bigger picture of history, we're just in one of those in-between periods. So yeah. but ultimately, though, I would just say, I see, I see your point. You know, I've heard that argument and it's not that there isn't a logic to it, but my question is, can we really be sure that that's the model? And no, no, I don't think we can be sure of either one. I mean, I don't think it'd be wise for us to shoot first. I will say that. Oh, no. That seems like that would go poorly regardless of which one, because I would also assume that those peace, peaceful civilizations have surely figured out by now that they have to uh, deal with hostiles. Yeah, and you might. Their yeah, technology it, it, would be first, juicy as well. Shooting first is not the wise move, but yeah. you know, uh, at least having the option to shoot back is probably smart. Yeah, and, I agree with that too. Yeah, uh, uh, an, an armed society is a polite society. <laughs> you know, militarizing <laughs> militarizing space is bad when you think about the concern that elitist using it against you mm -hmm. know the people of this world mm -hmm. uh but uh, other than that i think it's a very logical and rational and and good idea when you're considering protecting this world and eventually yeah. you know we are going to encounter again some civilization coming from another world now do we want to be um uh uh, technologically primitive again where they can come in and say yeah yeah we're we're gods yeah you know right. and then lord it over us and and mm -hmm. you know cast us into darkness you know like they they've done you know with superstition over yeah it's you know some people argue that that's the secret of what yahweh was all about he was just mm -hmm. some you know space guy who yeah 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 i'm a god so Right. Anyway, that again, a whole other discussion. We'll yeah, have to have we can we can definitely talk about that. Okay, so last question. Sure. Friend of mine wanted me to ask you this. It's purely speculative and it's simple. It, so you and I both believe there's a clandestine. I'll just use that term so we don't get confused with the yeah. with the trash junk conspiracy. A clandestine space program, uh -huh. right? Or multiple? I'm of the belief that there's at yeah. least two and probably more. Sure. Okay. Um, how far out do you think they've gone with that? Like, do you think they've gone to, do you think they've reached Mars? Do you think they've gone to the edge of the planet? Do you think they've left the solar system with this technology? I, I don't think so they've... speculative. I'm just curious yeah, what you I, think. Me personally, I don't mm -hmm. think it's so advanced that we've left the solar system. I, I think, um, I, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to suspect that we've at least put boots on Mars once yeah. or twice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that's unreasonable, but that, in my opinion, would be the extent. Of, that's pretty much what I got too. I think this idea of having built. these these massive starships and Starfleet that that's just fantasy. That's yeah. ridiculous. Um, you talking about that Gary McKinnon hack, or well, uh, you know what? Uh, you know, there might be more nugget of value in McKinnon. Uh -huh. There's certainly, I think, possibly more nugget of value in McKinnon than there than you're gonna find in in Corey Good or Emery Smith or any of these oh, other yeah. Yahoos claiming what they're claiming. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, Randy Kramer and and all them. This this yeah. time jumping super commando fighting bugs on my. It's and, and isn't it's it interesting BS. how isn't it interesting how now that they're talking about it in Congress all of a sudden. 
that they seem to be embracing the weirdest and always scariest shit, right? With this this recent CIA push and talking about in Congress and and they want to hopefully I won't end up in prison for having talked in the past before they you know they're trying to pass laws saying that uh independent ufo research would be yeah. legal or something like that where i'm just like well one one congressman what? brought that up and immediately yeah. you know I'm, i mean he got the a-hole label from me it's like really guy yeah. really you know yeah. but uh, and he's a counterintelligence guy too which is of creepy. course you know i'm right. a counterintelligence guy and that pissed me off to hear yeah that. Like, really you know but um it's, uh, but this goes back to my interpretation of Von Braun. Here's the thing. It's not that there's not going to be a threat from space, people. I mean, when I say a threat from space, I mean, I'm sorry, but at, at some point, an intelligent, technologically advanced civilization is not going to be all peace and love, okay? There's going right. to be some intelligent, technolo technologically advanced civilization that are warmongers, that are conquest-driven, that were able to get off their planet. Because, yes, you know, being I agree. That way. And, I'm 100% convinced that exists, yes. We're going to face them. I think yep. what Von Braun was warning us is our own elitists and globalists are going to use that potential threat to make us buy into all these draconian controls, much yes. like the war on terrorism was used for that, much like uh, the COVID situation was used mm -hmm. in that way, something that is real, but we're going to go wildly out of control in order to get control of you. Yeah. Um, I think that's the really what von Braun was warning us about because that's interesting my you know the last thing on that I'll say is the idea that there's not going to be any threatening civilizations from space just I just don't think is realistic I don't either I'm of the belief that both exist uh, I'm I, I'm of the belief and that's just my personal opinion intuition whatever that the majority of them are reasonable, some sure. kind of reasonable, yeah. and that you could at least negotiate yeah. or trade with them. That sure. level of reason, they There's might do be it from a, be lots of those. They might yeah. be do it from right, exactly. There'd be basically, I'd say, any behaviors that you can observe among humans, you can copy and paste that out into space. I yeah. don't think that the majority are going to be as aggressive as our species is, but I do think we that can. at least some of them will be and that it's foolish to 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 suspect that either they're all hostile or they're all peaceful i think that clearly both would exist well i don't think we're so awful that we're mm -hmm. an anomaly or an exception i i mm -hmm. think we're probably middle of the road and yeah, that's probably um, true actually you know there's going to be there's going to be good ones and bad ones. When we encounter the bad ones, it's going to feel like the whole universe is against us if their technology is sufficiently advanced beyond us because we could be sitting ducks. And I'm not trying to foster mm -hmm. paranoia or whatever. I'm just being realistic. Um, yeah. You know, despite the Von Braun thing that everybody loves to cling to, you know, mm -hmm. that thinks there's no threat from out there, uh, mm -hmm. there are folks in spite of that, there is likely a threat out there. Yeah, yeah, I I think being prepared is and, and sure. not ignoring that possibility is wise, yeah. especially given like yeah. you say, like human history, we can see that, you know, how different would it have been if uh, you know the peoples of the America had firearms, you know, or uh, yeah. you know, at least rudimentary firearms, it would have been a very different encounter. If they had had the same level of technology as the Europeans at that time, they would have been able to say, oh hell no. Yeah, no, right, you're not going right. to come wipe us out. No, you're right. not going to do this to us. Even even if it was like somewhat close, but it was just the gap was. Oh, it was. Yeah, wide. there was such a technological gap that you know we know what happened and right. Um, you know, so there we go. Yeah. But we got lots to talk about next time. So yes, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Walter. And that seems sure. like a great place to stop. And then I'll talk with you for a minute afterwards. But um, okay. thank you again, viewer, for um, sitting through that. I hope that you found that as uh, enjoyable and fascinating as I did. Um, I really enjoyed the, the flowing conversational nature of that. Um, so if you got this far, please uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed it and you'd like to see more similar content please um, go and buy some of Walter's books. I'm going to include all of his links down below. Um, definitely get definitely get this book. I can 100% vouch for this. His Secret Missions book, um, the, what I do know about them is awesome. And also The Empire of the Wheel is very fascinating. It delves more into the occult and 
this mystery of these serial murders that happened in California um, in the early part of the 20th century that um, is pretty obscure. Most people don't know about it, and it ties into some interesting secret society uh, mystery school kind of uh, stuff and very fascinating. So I highly recommend all of Walter's work. Also um, check out his, he has his own YouTube channel and I'm going to include all his information down below before I, uh, or when this video gets uploaded. And so um, thank you so much and um, see you next time. Bye.